Okay, hello, I'm back again. I'm gonna try to do things a little bit differently tonight. I have been struggling to get videos made on the indictment here. And for some reason, I'm not sure why, but they are just not getting through and <laughs> getting published. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do a, a live tonight on this indictment. And then I think I'm going to probably let this uh, go <laughs> rather than doing a series of videos on it. Because that is just not working out for me. So... I started a little bit later tonight. Hopefully I can get enough people in that have questions and are interested. Uh, I will go through these uh, piece at a time, a little bit at a time. You can see I've already have some markings here from videos I've tried to make earlier, but they are just not posting for some reason. So I will just walk everybody through this. Now I am a former prosecutor. I am currently a licensed attorney, so I have absolutely no stake whatsoever in this lawsuit. I'm just, or in this criminal case, this isn't the Dominion case. I did a different video on that one, but I am just going to go through what this means and the different pieces to it. it this is absolutely available online and you can go online and you can put in this information here and put in a federal indictment. So if you just put that into your search engine, you will find it. What you want to do is make sure that you have an official copy. And an official copy just means that it's not something that's been recreated and then put online. This is an actual copy of what has been filed in court. And you can see because there has been a uh, court mark here. So you need something like this to make sure that the document is official, official, an official copy so that it's not something that's just been put together. So let me walk us through this. We've got 37 counts, 30, technically 38 here, but we've got a lot of very interesting information that has come out in this indictment. So I thought I'd walk you through just from the perspective of a former prosecutor as we go through some of this language. Again, I've uh, attempted to make a few videos on this, but for some reason it's just not seeming to get published. So I will just do this last live and kind of uh, go through the language and what everything means. So if anyone's got questions, feel free to ask. So let's get started. We've got uh, this is how we know that this is an official document, an official copy of a document that's public. In case anyone is interested, this is a public document. Now, this was filed uh, June 8th, 2023, and it was charged by a grand jury. Now, remember that a grand jury only needs to find probable cause that there have been violations of the law. Now, these are all of the different code sections, the United States code sections that are in question here, and they go through this entire indictment and explain uh, how each of these different code sections have been violated. So that's what I'm going to walk you through today. But this is not finding of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt by any means. This is not a trial. This is an indictment, and the level of evidence that's needed is evidence of a probable cause to show, to believe that the defendants named are the ones that actually committed the offenses. So let's go through the language here. Um, and I will, this will probably be my last time showing this, um, but this will be my final hurrah as we walk through the language of this actual indictment here. So here we go. We've got a grand jury that was pulled in and they're looking at evidence that the prosecutor is putting on. Uh, no one had been charged when they were looking at evidence and so there is no defendant, so only the state would put on the case. Here, of course, the federal government. So here's the introduction, number one. Donald J. J. Trump was the 45th president of the United States of America. He held office from January 20th to 2017 until January 20th of 2021. As president, Trump had lawful access to the most sensitive classified documents. Now what I am doing is I am, I have read through all of these different code sections that 
are being uh, set out as the ones that have been violated. And there are multiple elements. And so anytime I see an element that is written in here, I just highlight it. So any of my highlights just go back to different elements required under the code sections that have been uh, alleged to have been violated here. Okay, again, this is just the indictment. So where was I here? Okay, so as President Trump had lawful access to the most sensitive classified documents and national defense information gathered and owned by the United States government, including information from the agencies that comprise the United States intelligence community and the United States Department of Defense. So that's number one. And then again, I'm just highlighting the different elements for the different charges here. Number two, over the course of his presidency, Trump gathered newspapers, press clippings, letters, notes, cards, photographs, official documents, and other materials in cardboard boxes that he kept in the White House. These cardboard boxes are going to come into play multiple times. Among the materials Trump stored in his boxes were hundreds of classified documents. Again, this is another element needed for the statutes that have been set out to have been violated. Number three, the classified documents Trump stored in his boxes included information regarding defense and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries. These are elements, again, to the offenses. United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack and to plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. The unauthorized disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States, foreign relations, the safety of the United States military and human sources, and the continued viability of sensitive intelligence collection methods. Now, keep in mind, uh, as I go through this, none of the classified information, of course, is in the indictment, so we will not have anything being divulged here that is not completely uh, public. So that's number three. Number four, at 12 p.m. January 20th of 2021, Trump ceased to be president. This is a key element because at that point, his level of access changes. As he departed the White House, Trump caused scores of boxes, many of which contain classified documents, to be transported to the Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach, Florida, where he maintained his residence. Trump was not authorized Again, this is another key element to possess or retain those classified documents. So we have a possession element and a retention element here. Again, these are set out in the statutes. Number five, the Mar-a-Lago Club was an active social club, which between January 2021 and August 2022 hosted events for tens of thousands of members and guests. This has to go uh, to the accessibility of those documents to the general public, to people that could come and go in wherever they were located. After Trump's presidency, the Mar-a-Lago Club was not an authorized location. This is set out again in the statute, what is an authorized location? For the storage, possession, review, display, or discussion of classified documents. Nevertheless, Trump stored his boxes containing classified documents in various locations at the Mar-a-Lago Club, including a ballroom, a bathroom and shower, an office space, his bedroom, and a storage room. These, again, will come into play because throughout this entire indictment, what you'll see is them documenting this uh, collection of documents. So all of these elections, or all of the, I'm sorry, all of these documents came from the White House. And where did they go next? And where did they go next until we finally have the proof here? Uh, that they are claiming in this indictment. Um, feel free to make comments, but let's keep them civil. I'm just here sharing information. All right, number six. Now we can move on to number six. On two occasions in January, in, in 2021, Trump showed classified documents to others as followed. And let's see. Oh, we'll get into who packed the boxes. That is very, very clearly um, designated uh, time and time again of exactly who was involved in the boxes. 
And that's an excellent question. So here are the pieces of evidence that they're offering in. They're saying July 2021 at the Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, during an audio recorded meeting with a writer, a publisher, and two members of his staff, none of whom possessed a security clearance. Again, I'm just highlighting the important pieces mentioned in the statutes. Trump showed and described a plan of attack that Trump said was prepared for him by the Department of Defense and a senior military official. Trump told the individuals that the plan was highly confidential and secret. Now what's important here is we've got this intent element and this knowledge element. Those are key pieces to any of these charges or whether or not it was uh, intentional. Now whether or not it was a joke uh, doesn't really matter uh, for purposes of the statute. And again, all of the statutes that are being alleged to have been violated are all listed in the very first page. So you can look and see uh, intent elements involved in there. And we do have legal standards when it comes to um, what kind of intent's involved. So here we go. Trump told the individual individuals that the plan was highly confidential and secret. Trump also said, as president, I could have declassified it and now I can't, you know but this is still a secret. This shows his knowledge of the records and that he knew what they were and knew they should be secret, knew he could no longer declassify them uh, and shared them anyway with these people mentioned. B, in August or September of 2021, at the Bedminster Club, Trump showed a representative of his political action committee who did not possess a security clearance a classified map related to the military operation and told the representative that he should not be showing it to him. Again, this shows his intent. So he knew what he was doing at the time to the representative and that the representative should not get too close. And again, that shows why, you know, if I was in court, I would ask um, why, why shouldn't you get too close? And that goes to show his intent. If you want something much, much more detailed as far as going through this, there are plenty of uh, options available online. What I have found is there are not a lot of user-friendly uh, showings of this indictment of people just walking through it so that anyone can understand the language as opposed to the legal theory behind everything. So that's my point for tonight, is to just make it accessible to everyone. Number seven, on March 30th of 2022, the FBI opened a criminal investigation into the unlawful retention of classified documents at the Mar-a-Lago Club. A federal grand jury investigation began the next month. And this is important because we've got charges saying that false information was given. The grand jury issued a subpoena requiring Trump to turn over all documents with classification markings. So they're specifying exactly what documents they want. Trump endeavored to obstruct the FBI and the grand jury investigations and conceal his continued retention of classified documents by, among other things... So this is key to the charge, and these are the facts that they have to back it up. A, suggesting his attorney falsely represent to the FBI and grand jury that Trump did not have the documents called for by the grand jury subpoena. B, directing defendant Waltine Nada to move boxes of documents to conceal them from Trump's attorney, the FBI and the grand jury. C, suggesting that his attorney hide or destroy documents called for by the grand jury subpoena. Of course, as attorneys, we have ethical obligations, and if we are asked to participate in a criminal activity, that can have some negative effects. Uh, D, providing to the FBI and the grand jury just some of the documents called for by the grand jury subpoena while claiming he was cooperating fully. So this is a key piece. He said he was cooperating fully but wasn't giving all the documents. Now, as... Uh, many of you, I'm sure, remember from doing a deep dive into the Nixon Watergate situation will remember then recall the subpoenas he was given. He gave some information to and said the rest of it he didn't have to. At the time, he was a sitting president, so he claimed executive privilege. A little bit different situation, but grand jury subpoena nevertheless. And E 
causing a certification to be submitted to the FBI and grand jury, falsely representing that all documents called for by the grand jury subpoena had been produced, while knowing, again, this is our intent element, in fact, not all such documents had been produced. All right, number eight. As a result of Trump's retention of classified documents after his presidency and refusal to return them, hundreds of classified documents were not recovered by the United States government until 2022, as follows. A, on January 17th, nearly one year after Trump left office and after months of demands by the National Archives and Records Administration for Trump to provide all missing presidential records, Trump provided only 15 boxes, which contained 197 documents with classification markings. On June 3rd, in response to a grand jury subpoena demanding the production of all documents with classification markings, Trump's attorney provided to the FBI 38 more documents with classification markings. So we have more boxes and more classification, classified documents here and C. On August 8th, pursuant to a court-authorized search warrant, the FBI recovered from Trump's office in a storage room at the Mar-a-Lago Club 102, 102 more documents. So here we're just adding up how many documents. Now, each and every single one of these documents uh, is going to be a separate charge. So those are all separate indictments. Um, yeah, I think anyone can read this themselves, but I am a licensed attorney, so I do have a little bit more insight into it. Um, and as far as any emails go, if anybody wants to send me a link or a citation to any emails or anything along those lines, I would be happy to go through any of those at any time. Trump's co-conspirator number nine. Defendant Nada was a member of the United States Navy, stationed as a valet in the White House during Trump's presidency. Beginning in August of 2021, Nada became an executive assistant to the office of Donald J. Trump and served as Trump's personal aide or body man. Nada reported to Trump, worked closely with Trump, and traveled with Trump. So right now they're setting up the foundation for his co-defendant, the Mar-a-Lago Club. Well... I'm not sure what was destroyed. If something was destroyed, it's true. I would be unable to uh, read it or acknowledge it. Yes, I have no position. I am absolutely neutral. Absolutely neutral here. And you can check out any of my other posts on uh, my channel. I post both sides, all sides, any sides. But I do post the truth. That's the one qualification I have. The Mar-a-Lago Club was located on South Ocean Boulevard in Palm Beach, Florida, and included Trump's residence, more than 25 guest rooms, two ballrooms, a spa, a gift store, exercise facilities, office space, and an outdoor pool and patio. As of January 2021, the Mar-a-Lago Club had hundreds of members and was staffed by more than 150 full-time, part-time, and temporary employees. So here... Yes, there's two sides to a story, correct, but there is the truth, and the truth is the truth. So I'm reading to you what has been filed as a federal document in a federal court. It doesn't get much more truthful than this. In fact, as uh, this shows, the truth is very important when dealing with federal documents. So we have uh, basically here, they are saying all of these people had access to the information, so number, and that's going to go for the uh, level of security that was around uh, the documents, number 11. Between January of 2021 and August 2022, the Mar-a-Lago Club hosted more than 150 social events. Again, they're showing access here, including weddings, movie premieres, and fundraisers that together drew tens of thousands of guests. So now we've got tens of thousands of possible breaches of security with the documentation. Number 12, the United States Secret Service provided protection services to Trump and his family after he left office, including at the Mar-a-Lago Club, but it was not responsible for the protection of Trump's boxes or their contents. This is a very important point because we can't say, uh, well, he thought that Secret Service was covering it 
or that somehow these classified documents were being kept secure. They are putting right here in the indictment, no, Secret Service clearly said that Trump did not inform the Secret Service that he was storing boxes containing classified documents at the Mar-a-Lago Club. Now, this asks the question, too, and if this ever gets to trial, I would ask Secret Service in this situation, what would you have done had he told you that there had been classified documents? What would the Secret Service's position have been? Because they do have certain oaths and obligations to the country as well as to the person they are protecting. Just as a question, just as a question, classified information. Now, again, keep in mind, this is a public document. All of this is completely public uh, and available to anyone that would like to look it up. Number 13, national security information was information owned by, produced by, produced for, and under the control of the United States government pursuant to an executive order signed on April of 1995, amended in March of 2003, and amended again December of 2009, national security information was classified into three categories. This again sets what level of charge we're looking at based on the level of confidentiality for the document. So of course, each one of the documents is going to be a separate charge, and each one of the documents has a different level of classification. So they're explaining here, they're setting out to the jury what the different levels of classifications mean. So we'll start first with, and again, all public information. Information that was classified as top secret if the unauthorized disclosure of that information reasonably could be expected to cause exceptionally grave damage to the national security that the original classification authority was able to identify or describe. Information was classified as secret if the unauthorized disclosure of that information reasonably could be expected to cause serious damage. So this is the different levels of uh, confidentiality to the national security. It was classified as confidential if the unauthorized disclosure of the information reasonably could be expected to cause damage. So we have three different levels of damage and three different levels of classifications. Uh, political witch hunt... I would prefer the term witch not be used. I believe that's quite derogatory to those that identify as witches. Next, we've got page six, which goes into number 14. And we have um, the classification markings of no foreign, which is a special classification, which stood for not releasable to foreign nationals as denoted. And um, again, this is all public information. Classified information related to intelligence sources, methods, and analytical processes was designated as sensitive comparted, compartmented information, or SCI. And this was processed, stored, used, or discussed in an accredited sensitive compartmented information facility. So you can see these documents were supposed to be kept in a particular place by particular people and only individuals with the appropriate security clearance and additional SCI permissions were authorized to have access to such national security information. So we had def have show here that there's a, a certain level that these documents needed to have. Number 16, when the vulnerability of or threat to specific classified information was exceptional and the normal criteria for determining eligibility for access to classified information were in insufficient to protect the information from unauthorized disclosure, the United States could establish an SAP, which is a special program that would further protect the classified information. So these documents and this information have very, very specific rules that had to be following. I'm reading, but I'm also trying to explain the information and catching some questions as we go along. So I'm breaking this apart uh, for everyone and trying to make sure that the uh, language, the legal language that's used here is just really easily understood for everybody. The number of these programs was to be kept to an absolute minimum, limited to programs in which the number of persons 
who ordinarily would have access would be reasonably small and commensurate with the objective of providing enhanced protection for the information involved. Only individuals with appropriate security clearance and additional SAP permissions were authorized to have access to such national security information, which was a subject to enhance handling and storage requirements. These kinds of enhanced uh, handling and storage requirements are exactly what are mentioned in these sections of the United States Code. Um, I'd be happy to talk about Clinton going to jail if you can produce any kind of documentation for that and send it my way. I'd be happy to go through that. Number 17, pursuant to Executive Order 13526, information classified at any level could be lawfully accessed only by persons determined by an appropriate United States government official to be eligible for access to classified information who had signed an approved non-disclosure agreement. So this is an NDA. I think we all know what an NDA is, who received a security clearance and who had a need to know the classified information. After his presidency, Trump was not authorized to possess or retain classified documentations. Again, this is just another element of those sections of the United States Code that are being alleged to have been violated. Number 18, another executive order provided that a former president could obtain a waiver, the need to know requirement, if the agency head or senior agency official of that agency originated the classified information. And one determined in writing that access was consistent with the interests of national security and two, took appropriate steps to protect the classified information from unauthorized disclosure and compromise and ensured that the information was safeguarded in a manner consistent with this order. Trump did not obtain any such waiver. So any kind of suggestion or defense that would be put on stating that he was authorized in his capacity after he left the president's office to have these documents, they're saying in this paragraph right here they're specifically quoting the law and saying he did not have that authorization he didn't have any waivers he did not have any authorization to possess or retain any of these documents next we go on to the executive branch departments and agencies whose classified documents trump retained after his presidency so this is going more into the documents but nothing that would be specific to any kind of classified information that could not be made available publicly. So, number 19, as part of his official duties as president, Trump received intelligence briefings from high-level U.S. government officials, including briefings from the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, senior White House officials, and a designated briefer. He regularly received a collection of classified intelligence from the United States intelligence community known as the President's Daily Brief. So this is establishing that while he was in office, he did receive classified information. Again, we're just setting up uh, the background information needed for how he came into possession of these documents. And as we go through this, what you'll see is we're, we're following this chain of custody. And anytime we have a case in criminal court, Whatever evidence we have, we have to establish that chain of custody. So from the moment that evidence was discovered all the way to the moment that we present it in front of our jury, we have to show every single step. And that's what they're doing here. They're showing every single step of every single one of these documents. Number 20, the United States intelligence community mission was to collect analyze and deliver foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information to Americans' leaders, including the president, policymakers, law enforcement, and military, so they could make sound decisions to protect the United States. The USIC consists of United States executive branch departments and agencies responsible for the conduct of foreign relations and the protection of national security. So anytime that we've got foreign countries' information that has been supposed to have been classified in question now becomes the issue of what's going to happen with uh, the country's belief that we'll be able to maintain classified documents. So that's what I'm assuming would be going on here. 
Number 21, after his presidency, Trump retained classified documents originated by or implicating the equities of multiple USIC members and other executive branch departments and agencies, including the following. So we'll get into some of the agencies that were involved here. And again, this is all public, public information for anyone listening. <laughs> I would love to meet your wife if she thinks I'm full of it, because as an attorney, we do love to debate. Moving on, the Central Intelligence Agency. So documents from here, we've got documents from the Department of Defense. We've got documents from the National Security Agency. We've got the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency documents. And they go through and explain these a little bit and what uh, kinds of documents were involved. Documents from the National Reconnaissance Office, documents from the Department of Energy, documents from the Department of State and Bureau of Intelligence and Research Department. Now again, keep in mind with an indictment, we just have a showing of probable cause to believe that there have been violations of the law. This is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So these are the different agencies' documents that were involved. So every single document has been accounted for. Next, we've got Trump's public statements on classified information. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but what they're showing here is his intent and his knowledge and understanding of the importance of classified documents. So they have multiple dates here where he said, that classified information needed to be protected, and that we can't have someone in the Oval Office who doesn't understand the meaning of the word confidential or classified, and various statements along with that. Again, this is all just to support this idea that he had some idea of uh, how important classified documents were. So this would go to the mens rea or the intent element. And you can take a look at those. I think a lot of different places have gone through um, all of those prior bits, but I don't believe I need to hear it. We're just going through the indictment. As President of the United States on July 26th of 2018, Trump issued the following statement about classified information. Again, so we're going to his mens rea. As the head of the executive branch and commander in chief, I have a unique constitutional responsibility to protect the nation's classified information, including by controlling access to it. These are President Donald Trump's words on July 26th of 2018. More broadly, the issue of former executive branch official security clearance raises larger questions about the practice of former officials maintaining access to our nation's most sensitive secrets. Again, this acknowledgement of the importance of classified documents long after the time in government has ended. So they've left their position in the government uh, as he did with these documents. Such access is particularly inappropriate when former officials have transitioned into highly partisan positions and seek to use real or perceived access to sensitive information to validate their political attacks. This is a direct statement given uh, in 2018. Any access granted to our nation's secrets should be in furtherance of national, not personal interests. Um, again, this is illustrating the mens rea or his knowledge of the importance of um, classified information. Boy, I'm getting a lot of questions about Biden, but I, I, like I said, I have looked and I have found nothing. This is an actual file document in a court of law. But I mean, again, if there's information out there, please, please send it to me. I would be very, very happy to go through that. Uh, I just have not found it through all of my legal research. Next, Trump's retention of classified documents after his presidency. Number 24, in January of 2021, he was preparing to leave the White House. Trump and his White House staff, including his co-defendant, packed items, including some of Trump's boxes. Trump was personally involved in this process, again, showing he knew what was going on and was involved, so he didn't delegate that to someone else. Trump causes his boxes containing hundreds of classified documents to be transported from the White House to the Mar-a-Lago Club. Again, this is our chain of evidence, our chain of custody. 
25 from January to March of 2021, some of Trump's boxes were stored in the Mar-a-Lago Club's white and gold ballroom, which was an events and gathering took place. The boxes were for a time stacked in the ballroom stage as depicted in the photograph below. Now, any sense of information would have already been redacted, so we don't have to worry about that. But this is showing, again, the violation of these United States Code sections when it comes to the uh, storage and keeping and guarding of classified documents. And this uh, would not satisfy the requirements uh, that were set out in those statutes. Number 26. In March 2021, Nada and others moved some of Trump's boxes from the white and gold ballroom to the business center at the Mar-a-Lago Club. Again, we're seeing uh, every single step of the way of where these documents have been uh, found. On April 5th of 2021, an employee of the office of Donald J. Trump texted another employee of that office to ask whether Trump's boxes could be moved out of the business center so again, we're following these documents to make room for staff to use it as an office. Trump employee two replied, whoa, okay, so POTUS specifically asked Walt for these boxes to be in the business center because they were his papers. Later that day, Trump employee one and Trump employee two exchanged the following text messages. This again is further information. It's a good question about why he would need them in his club. Um... It, it has to do with uh, somehow, I would imagine, and I'm just guessing, it, ha- it would have to do with his control over uh, the documents. And so that was an area he had control over. And so he had wanted uh, to put the documents in an area that he was in charge of. So here are the text messages. Again, this is what's presented to the grand jury to give them probable cause to go forward on those indictments. So we've got employee two, we can definitely make it work if we move his papers into the lake room. Employee one, there's still a little room in the shower where his other stuff is. Uh, Again, showing where classification documents, um, classified documents were going to be. It is only his papers he cares about. There's some other stuff too in there that are not papers. That's interesting. I wonder what else could be. Uh, Maybe the Ark of the Covenant. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm going to lose everybody who's watching now. (laughs) Could that go to storage or does he want everything in there on the property? Employee two. Yes. Anything that's not the beautiful mind paper boxes can definitely go to storage. Want to take a look at the space and start moving tomorrow in the morning. So again, this is evidence being shown for probable cause. After the text exchange between employee one and employee two, some of Trump's boxes were moved to the business center to a bathroom and a shower in the Mar-a-Lago's lake room as depicted in the photograph below. And then we've got another picture and anything sensitive has been redacted. So this is all public information. And it's showing again, this uh, chain of custody. It's the same thing if we would have found a weapon or a piece of DNA or something at a crime scene. Wherever that evidence started from, we would watch it every single step along the way, whichever room it was moved to, whichever locker it was moved to. And that's what they're showing here. So from the day he left the White House, where those documents were, and then each step along the way. 29. In May of 2021, Trump directed that a storage room on the ground floor of the Mar-a-Lago Club be cleared out so it could be used to store his boxes. The hallway leading to the storage room could be reached from multiple outside entrances. So this goes to access again, which is in the statute, including one accessible from the Mar-a-Lago Club pool patio through a doorway that was often kept open. Again, we have a security issue. The storage room was near the liquor supply closet, linen room, lock shop, and various other rooms. Number 30. On June 24th of 2021, the boxes that were in the lake room were moved to the storage room. So we're following these boxes along. After that move, there are more than 80 boxes in the storage room, as depicted in the photographs below. All past presidents probably do have um, some issues and have been called out in one way or another. 
And I believe if you look at the uh, information here, and not just this indictment, but the other information, including subpoenas, you'll see that the FBI repeatedly did ask in this particular situation, like, we just want the documents back. That's, that's all we want. We just want the documents back. So here are some pictures, again, of the location of the documents. On December 7th of 2021, Nada found several of Trump's boxes had fallen over, their contents spilled onto the floor. Again, that goes to the level of security of the classified documents, including a document marked secret. REL to USA, FVEY, which denoted information in the document was released only to the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, consisting of these countries here. So these are our close allies in that information. Yes, they were classified. If it was labeled, it could have been labeled classified. It could have been labeled top secret or confidential. Those are the three different types of classifications specifically set out in the statute as well as in this indictment. Nada texted Trump employee two. I opened the door and found this. Nada also attached two photographs he took of the spill. So these are actual photographs by the co-defendant. Trump employee two replied, oh no, oh no. Oh no, and I'm sorry, POTUS had my phone. One of the photographs, not a texted at Trump employee two, is depicted below with the visible classified information redacted. Trump's unlawful retention of this document is charged in count eight of this indictment. So this is an actual uh, picture that was made by the co-defendant. Trump's disclosures of classified information in private meetings. So now we're getting into another element of the statute. So in May of 2021, Trump caused some of his boxes to be brought to his summer residence. So you have another location. So we're following the evidence here. Like the Mar-a-Lago Club after Trump's presidency, the Bedminster Club was not an authorized location. Again, that's required by statute. For the storage, possession, review, display, or discussion of classified document. Highlighter has run out, so I'll get a fresh one here. Okay, was not authorized location for the storage, possession, review, display, or discussion of classified documents. So for any reason whatsoever. Did someone just call me a terrible lawyer? I'm sorry, but I've been called that so many times. You're going to have to get a little bit more creative. Although be careful, we've got community standards here. On July 21st, 2021, when he was no longer president, Trump gave an interview in his office at the Bedminster Club to a writer and publisher in connection with the then forthcoming book. So this is really an issue here because we've got a book coming up, apparently, and so classified information given to someone who could publish that um, could be an issue. Two members of Trump's staff also attended the interview, which was recorded with Trump's knowledge and consent. So he had information. He knew what was happening. Before the interview, the media had published reports that at the end of Trump's term as president, a senior military off official purportedly feared that Trump might order an attack on a particular country and that the senior military official advised Trump against doing so. Again, this is uh, classified information. Um, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, moving on. 34. Upon greeting the writer, publisher, and his two staff members, Trump stated, look what I found. This was, and then the official's plan of attack, read it and just show it's interesting. Later in the interview, Trump engaged in the following exchange. So this is an exchange that was uh, actually um, documented. So we have Trump saying, well, with the senior military official... Let me see that. I'll show you an example. He said that I wanted to attack. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing just came up. That might go to the lack of organization of the classified documents. Look, this was him. They presented me this. This is off the record. So he is acknowledging that this may not be something that's meant for public knowledge. But they presented me this. This was him. This was the Defense Department and him. The writer said, wow. As a response, Trump responded, we looked at some, this was him, this wasn't done by me, this was him, all sorts of stuff, pages long, look. The staffer, mm-hmm, 
Trump said, wait a minute, let's see here. The Stafford, there's laughter. Trump said, I just found this. Isn't this, isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case, you know. The Stafford says, mm-hmm, which by the way is something that's relatively difficult to document. And Trump said, except it is like highly confidential, which is his acknowledgement, his him admitting that he knows these records are confidential, according to this indictment. The staff is laughing. Trump is saying secret. This is secret information. Look at this. And again, this is his acknowledgement. He knows what it is that he's referring to. By the way, isn't that incredible? The staff are saying, yeah. Trump is saying, I was just thinking because we were talking about it. You know, he said he wanted to, and then going on, uh, staff are saying you did. Trump is saying this was done by the military, given to me. I don't know. We'll have to see, says the staffer. Trump says declassify it. Staffer says figure out a... Trump said, see, as president, I could have declassified it. The staffer says, yeah. Trump says, now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. This is uh, particularly damaging information here because he had um, full knowledge that there could be a declassification process, but knew now that he was out of office that that um, was not um, a possibility. Staffer is laughing. Now we have a problem, uh, and Trump is saying, that not that interesting? At the time of this exchange, the writer, the publisher, and Trump's two staff members did not have security clearance. Again, clearance is required, or any need to know classified information about a plan of attack on the country mentioned. Number 35, in August or September of 2021, when he was no longer president, Trump met in his office at the Bedminster Club with a representative of his political action committee. During the meeting, Trump commented that an ongoing military operation in the country was not going well. Trump showed the PAC representative a classified map, again, this level of classification, of this country and told the PAC representative that he should not be showing the map to the PAC again. This speaks to him knowing he should not be doing this and to not get too close. Again, maybe as a way of trying to protect the document in some way, showing that he acknowledges the importance the PAC representative did not have a security clearance or any need to know classified information about the military operation. Number 36, on February 16th of 2017, four years before Trump's disclosures of classified information set forth, Trump said at a press conference uh, here, and then and I'm not going to go through this. This is more information, just acknowledging that he really knows uh, that uh, classified information needs to be protected. Now we've got Trump's production of 15 cardboard boxes to the National Archives and Records Administration. Number 37, beginning in May of 2021, the National Archives and Records Administration, which was responsible for archiving presidential records, repeatedly demanded that Trump turn over presidential records that he had kept after his presidency. So May of 2021, we need to acknowledge that date. On multiple occasions, beginning in June, they warned Trump through his representatives that if he did not comply, they would refer the matter of the missing records to the Department of Justice. So they knew that there were records that were missing and that Trump had those records and said, please give us the records or we're going to need to refer this on. Next, between November and 2021 and January of 2022, Nada and Trump, employee two at Trump's direction, brought the boxes from the storage room to Trump's residence for Trump to review. Okay, again, we're following these documents wherever they go so we can um, make sure that we have the right people to sit on the stand to testify to that. Number 39, on November 12th of 2021, Trump employee two provided Trump a photograph of his boxes in the storage room by taping it to one of the boxes Trump employee two had placed in Trump's residence. Trump employee two provided Trump the photograph so that Trump could see how many of his boxes were stored in the storage room. The photograph shown below depicted a wall of storage room against which dozens of Trump's boxes were stacked. Any private information, of course, has already been re re 
redacted, but you can see again, they are just following the papers. Literally every single sheet of paper, they know what it is, where it's at, and they're following it. Number 40, on November 17th of 2021, not a texted Trump employee too about the photograph Trump employee two had provided to Trump, stating he mentioned about a picture of the boxes he wants me to see it. Trump employee two replied, calling you shortly. 41. So on November 25th, just a few days later, Trump employee two texted Nada about Trump's review of the contents of the boxes, asking, has he mentioned boxes to you? I delivered some, but I think he may need more. Could you ask if he'd like more in the pine hall? Again, we're following each each and every single one of these documents. Pine Hall was an entry room in Trump's residence. Not a replied in three successive text messages here. Nothing about boxes. He has one he's working on in the Pine Hall. Knocked out two boxes yesterday. Number 42. A couple of days later, November 29th, employee two texted not asking. Next you are on property, no rush. Could you help bring four boxes, four more boxes up? Not a replied, yes, of course. And then in December, employee two texted a Trump representative who was in contact with uh, Nara, a Trump representative. One, the box answer will be wrenched out of him today, promise. The next day, Trump representative one replied in two successive text messages Hey, just checking in on the boxes. Would love to have a number to them today. This again just shows this uh, continuing on of knowing where the boxes were, what was in the boxes, and going through and reviewing it. So it goes to intent. 12 is his number. Number 44. January 13th, so just a few weeks later, texted Trump employee two about Trump's tracking of boxes. He's tracking the boxes, more to follow today on whether he wants to go through more today or tomorrow. And employee two replied, thank you. It's actually interesting how um, uh, specific they are in what is in these boxes. So uh, as, as they were moved out of the White House and then into various different spaces and various people were in charge of them, they did have some kind of uh, organization pattern because they are able to trace it. Number 45 on January 15th, Nada sent Trump employee two, four successive text messages. One thing he asked was for new covers for the boxes for Monday morning. Can we get new box covers before giving these to them on Monday? They have too much writing on them. I marked too much. So again, this is showing more of a designation of they know what documents are in those boxes. Trump employee two replied, yes, I will get that. Number 46, on January 17th of 2022, Trump employee two and Nada gathered 15 boxes from Trump's residence, loaded the boxes into Nada's car, took them to a commercial truck for delivery. Number 47, when interviewed by the FBI in May of 2022 regarding the location and movement of the boxes before the production to Nara, Nada made false and misleading statements as set forth in count 38 of this indictment, including... Now, Nada, you will see at the very end, has a number 38, um, specifically because of these three pieces that he participated in. So these are specific to the co-defendant. Falsely stating he was not aware of Trump's boxes being brought into Trump's residence for his review before Trump provided 15 boxes to Nara in January. Again, Nara is the National Archive Record uh, Association there. B, falsely stating that he did not know how the boxes that he and Trump employee two brought from Trump's residence to the commercial truck for delivery to uh, NARA on January 17th had gotten to the residence. And when he asked whether he knew where Trump's boxes had been stored before they were in Trump's residence and whether they had been in secure lock location, not a false reported, I wish. I wish I could tell you. I don't know. I don't. I honestly just don't know. This is a direct quote here. So, of course, this would be a hearsay testimony, but there would be multiple exceptions uh, that would allow for this kind of testimony to come in. Uh, If you're looking for a copy of this indictment, it is just online. You can just go online and you can put in a U.S. v. Trump federal indictment and look through the prompts that they give you and there will be 
a document, uh, especially you'll, you'll want to look for the PDF and one that's got a stamp in the corner of it so you know that's accurate. Number 48, when the 15 boxes that Trump had provided reached NARA in January of 2022, NARA viewed the contents, determined 14 of the boxes contained documents with classification markings. Specifically, as the FBI later determined, the boxes contained 197 documents with classification markings, of which 98 were secret, 30 were marked top secret, and the remainder were marked confidential. Some of those documents also contained SCI and SAP markings. Again, those are more classifications. Number 49, on February 9th, NARA referred the discovery of classified documents in Trump's boxes to the Department of Justice for investigation. Now, the FBI and the grand jury investigation come in. Number 50, March 30th of 2022, the FBI opened a criminal investigation. And on April 26th of 2022, a federal grand jury opened an investigation. We've got the FBI and a grand jury involved now, which now gets us into different sections of the United States Code again of things that are being charged because of information given to the FBI and to the grand jury. The defendant's concealment of boxes, number 52. On May 11th of 2022, the grand jury issued a subpoena to the office of Donald J. Trump requiring the production of all documents with classification markings in the possession, custody, or control of Trump or the office of Donald J. Trump, two attorneys representing Trump, attorney one and attorney two, inform Trump of the May 11th subpoena. This is key here. And he authorized Trump attorney one to accept service. Service was accepted. Number 53, on May 22nd, Nada entered the storage room at 347, left approximately 34 minutes later, carrying one of Trump's boxes. This evidence, again, I've, I've put in front of a jury. Um, Juries like to have that kind of very specific information, so there must have been a camera involved. 54, on May 23rd, Trump met with Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 2 at Mar-a-Lago Club to discuss the response to the May 11th subpoena. Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 2 told Trump that they needed to search for documents that would be responsive to the subpoena and provide a certification, and this is a legal document, that there had been a compliance with the subpoena. Trump, in sum and substance, made the following statements, among others, as memorialized by Trump Attorney 1. So these are specific to uh, information that the attorney took down. I don't want anybody looking. I don't want anybody looking through my boxes. I really don't. I don't want you looking through my boxes. B, well, what if we, what happens if we just don't respond at all or don't play ball with them? Again, this is in response to a subpoena with a court order. Wouldn't it be better if we just told them we didn't, we don't have anything here, uh, which would be incorrect, false information? D, well, look, isn't it better if there are no documents? Um, so <laughs> I'm just glancing at the comments here. So we've got these four pieces here that his attorney can testify to. Attorney-client privilege, of course, is uh, broken if the uh, client is asking you to do something illegal. It also gets broken if there are other people involved. So if another person's in the room or if that information can be um, heard by another person, that attorney-client privilege can be broken. And in this particular situation, we have uh, some pretty serious uh, requests regarding uh, what could be viewed very easily as illegal activity. I'm not saying that it is. I'm saying that the attorney, as an attorney myself, if I had a client ask this information of me, uh, I would feel confident saying I was being asked to do something illegal. While testifying with Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 2 on May 23rd, Trump in sum and substance told the following story as memorialized by Trump Attorney 1. Again, we've got uh, documentation from Trump Attorney 1. He was great. He did a great job. You know what? He said He said that it, that it was him, that he was the one who deleted all of her emails, the 30,000 emails, because they basically dealt with her scheduling and her going to the gym and her having beauty appointments, and he was great. And he, so she didn't get into any trouble because he said that he was the one who deleted them. Trump related the story more than once that day. I think we can all 
uh, make our own assessment about the relevance of that. Number 56, on May 23rd, Trump also confirmed his understanding with Trump attorney one, that Trump attorney one would return to the Mar-a-Lago club on June 2nd to search for any documents with classification markings to produce in response to the May 11th subpoena. Trump attorney one made it clear to Trump that Trump attorney one would conduct the search for responsive documents by looking through Trump's boxes that had been transported from the White House and remain in storage at the Mar-a-Lago club. Trump indicated that he wanted to be at the club when Trump attorney one returned to review his boxes on June 2nd and that Trump would change his summer travel plans in order to do that. Trump told Trump attorney two that Trump attorney two did not need to be present for review of boxes. Okay, so I'm trying to keep up with your your comments here. Well, <laughs> oh. all right, move, moving on. You guys are, and gals are hilarious. 57, after meeting with Trump attorney one and Trump attorney two on May 23rd, Trump delayed his departure from the Mar-a-Lago club to the Bedminster Club for the summer so that he would be present at the Mar-a-Lago Club on June 2nd when Trump Attorney 1 returned to review the boxes. Number 58, between Trump's May 23rd meeting with Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 2 to discuss the May 11th subpoena and June 2nd, so between May 23rd and June 2nd of last year, when Trump Attorney 1 returned to the Mar-a-Lago Club to review the boxes in the storage room, not a removed at Trump's discretion, at Trump's direction, a total of approximately 64 boxes from the storage room and brought them to Trump's residence as set forth below. And they have a specific date and time when those boxes were moved from the storage room. Again, we are following uh, this evidence. Now, this document that I'm reading through is the federal indictment. It is free, available online. And you can look for it. It's U.S. v. Trump federal indictment. So B goes into May 30th at 9.08. Trump and Nada spoke by phone for approximately 30 seconds. Between 10.02 a.m. and 11.51 a.m., Nada removed a total of approximately 50 boxes from the storage room. And each one of these documents is being followed, tagged and followed throughout this entire process. On May 30th at 12.33 p.m., the Trump family member texted Nada, Good afternoon, Walt. Happy Memorial Day. I saw you put boxes to POTUS room. Jeff, FYI. And I will tell him as well, not sure how many he wants to take on Friday on the plane. We will not have a room for them. Plane will be full with luggage. Thank you. And Nada replied, Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think he wanted to pick from them. I don't imagine him wanting to take the boxes. He told me just to put them in the room and that he was going to talk to you about them. Now, a couple of just interesting side notes, uh, just as an attorney in general, what, what could be argued on his side is that he is trying to be very careful with these documents and take care of them and make sure he knew where they all were. So that could be uh, definitely a part of his argument was, you know, I watched and made sure I knew where every single document was and where every single box was. But where he's going to get into trouble is that he didn't have any authorization to actually have those documents to begin with. So, and then D, and that's just my, my thoughts on the situation. On June 1st of 2022, beginning at 12.52 p.m., Nada removed approximately 11 boxes. And again, the fact that all of this is so carefully, um, documented is a positive uh, as far as national security goes, but is a negative in that he should not have had these uh, documents to begin with. According to this indictment, he was not given the uh, qualification or the authority to have these documents to begin with. On June 1st of 2022, that would be last year, Trump spoke with Trump Attorney 1 by phone, asked whether Trump Attorney 1 was coming to the Mar-a-Lago Club the next day. For exactly what purpose, Trump Attorney 1 reminded Trump that Trump Attorney 1 was going to review the boxes that had been transported from the White House and remained in storage at the Mar-a-Lago Club so that Trump Attorney 1 could have a custodian of records certified that May 11th subpoena had been complied with fully. So we've got that May 11th subpoena. I'm not sure what you believe is faith, but I can assure you that this document is 
legitimately been filed in federal court. Number 60 on June 2nd of 2022, the day that Trump attorney one was scheduled to review tw- Trump's boxes in the storage room, Trump spoke with Nada on the phone at 9.29 a.m. These kinds of details are spectacular for proving probable cause. This is not proving beyond a reasonable doubt, just probable cause for approximately 24 seconds. That level of detail is really quite something. Later that day, between 12.33 and 12.52 p.m., Nada and an employee of the Mar-a-Lago Club moved approximately 30 boxes from Trump's residence to the storage room. Again, we're following these along like we would any chain of custody, any, any piece of evidence. In some, between May 23rd and June 2nd, before Trump's attorney won reviewed of Trump's boxes in the storage room, Nada, at Trump's discretion, moved approximately 64 boxes from the storage room to Trump's residence and brought to the storage room only approximately 30 boxes. So there was a review of boxes, but yet only a certain number was uh, actually moved. Neither Trump nor Nada informed Trump attorney one of this information. And that goes to the culpability of Trump attorney one and his knowledge during his testimony. Um, just checking comments here. Okay, no no need for name calling, please. Thank you. The false certification to the FBI and the grand jury, number 63. This again, we're talking about specific violations of the United States Code. On the afternoon of June 2nd of 2022, last year, as Trump had been informed, Trump Attorney One arrived at the Mar-a-Lago Club to review Trump's boxes to look for documents with classification markings. Remember, we have those three separate levels of classifications. In response to the May 11th subpoena, and this is a court order, Trump met with the Trump Attorney One before Trump Attorney One conducted the review. Nada escorted Trump Attorney One to the storage room. 64. Between 3.53 and 6.23 p.m., Trump Attorney One reviewed the contents of Trump's boxes in the storage room. Trump Attorney One located 38 docu- documents with classification markings. And again, this is where the violation of the law is. Um, inside the boxes, which Trump Attorney One removed and placed in a folder. All right, so now we've got movement of these documents. Again, if we are following the evidence, the chain of custody here, uh, here are evidence. We've got documents. We move them now to a folder, so we need to follow the folder. Trump Attorney One contacted Nada and asked him to bring clear duct tape to the storage room, which Nada did. Trump Attorney One used the clear duct tape to seal the folder with the documents with the classified markings. Now, again, this goes to show how um, important that people knew uh, these documents were because there was an attempt here to seal them, to keep them um, from being seen. So by Trump Attorney One, and that is a specific uh, an act to show that. Number 65, after Trump Attorney One finished sealing the folder containing the documents with the classification markings that he found inside Trump's boxes, Nada took Trump Attorney One to the dining room in the Mar-a-Lago Club to meet with Trump. After Trump Attorney One confirmed that he was finished with his search of the storage room, Trump asked, did you find anything? Is it bad? Good? All right, there's an acknowledgement there. Number 66, Trump and Trump Attorney One then discussed what to do with the folder containing the documents with classification markings and whether Trump Attorney One should bring them to his hotel room and put them in a safe there. Again, this shows intent in the acknowledgement of how important these documents were. So there's no question of, I didn't know what these documents were. Um, They knew these particular documents that were sealed in this folder were classified documents. During that conversation, Trump made a plucking motion as memorialized by Trump Attorney One. He made a funny motion as though, well, okay, why don't you take them with you to your hotel room? And if there's anything really bad in there, like, you know, pluck it out. And there was a motion that he made. He didn't say that. Interesting. Well documented. Attorneys, that's one thing we can do is document. What kind of law do I practice? I do a little bit of everything. Uh, So that evening, Trump Attorney One contacted the Department of Justice, requested the FBI agent meet him at the Mar-a-Lago Club the next day, June 3rd, so he could turn over the documents responsive to the May 11th subpoena. 
68. Also that evening, Trump attorney one contacted another Trump attorney. Trump attorney three has now entered and asked her if she would come to the Mar-a-Lago club the next morning to act as a custodian of records and sign a certification regarding the search for the documents, which classification markings in response to the May 11th subpoena. Trump attorney three, who had no role in the review of Trump's boxes in the storage room, agreed. That could be seen as perhaps suspect. Definitely a probable cause element for a grand jury. The next day on June 3rd, the Trump Attorney 1's request, Trump Attorney 3 signed the certification. Now we've got Trump Attorney 1 implicated because he's asking Trump Attorney 3 to sign something as the custodian of the records for the office of jo Donald J. Trump and took it to the Mar-a-Lago Club to provide it to the Department of Justice and FBI. In the certification, Trump Attorney 3, who performed no search of Trump's boxes, had not reviewed the May 11th subpoena. and had not reviewed the contents of the folder that had been sealed with the clear duct tape, stating, among other things, that based upon the information that had been provided to her, which is a classic attorney line, well, based on the knowledge that I personally have, <laughs> a diligent search was conducted of the boxes that were moved from the White House to Florida, which technically could be true, according to what she felt a diligent search was, B, the search was conducted after the receipt of the subpoena in order to locate any and all documents that, responsive to the, that were, are responsive to the subpoena, which again, she, even though she just gave, uh, was just given the subpoena, that technically could be true. And C, any and all responsive documents accompany the certification. So this would definitely be a very uh, legal answer. And there are some questions on attorney three and her answers were very carefully worded. These statements, as mine, would be as well if I was in that situation. So, although I, I am not. These statements were false because, among other reasons, Trump had directed Nada to move the boxes before Trump Attorney 1's June 2nd review. So now we're going all the way back to Trump Attorney 1, who was asking Trump Attorney 3 to sign this. So the original information was inaccurate June 2nd review so that many of the boxes were not searched. Many documents responsive to May 11th subpoena could not be found and in fact were not found by Trump Attorney 1. 71. Shortly after Trump Attorney 3 executed the false certification on June 3rd, Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 3 met at the Mar-a-Lago Club with personnel from the Department of Justice and the FBI. Trump Attorney 1, Trump Attorney 3 turned over the folder containing documents with classified markings as well as the false certification signed by the Trump Attorney 3 as custodian of records. Trump, who was delayed, who had delayed his departure from the Mar-a-Lago Club, joined Trump Attorney 1 and Trump Attorney 3 for some of the meeting. Trump claimed that the Department of Justice and FBI, that he was an open book. Again, this goes to this idea that he was providing uh, false information or claiming he was being uh, helpful, but was not in fact being helpful. Number 72, then this is just my thought. Earlier the same day, Nada had others load several of Trump's boxes along with other items on an aircraft that flew Trump and his family north for the summer. So again, we're continuing to follow these uh, documents. So they're now flying in a plane. The court authorized search of the Mar-a-Lago Club. 73, in July of 2022, the FBI and grand jury obtained and reviewed surveillance video from the Mar-a-Lago Club showing the movement of the boxes set forth above. So we are tracking, <laughs> we are, my, my phone's getting hot too. We are tracking these boxes, literally every single inch that they are being moved so we can find out exactly where they're going. And then number 74, on August 8th, the FBI executed a court authorized search warrant at the Mar-a-Lago Club the search warrant authorized the FBI to search for and seize, among other things, all documents with classification markings. Number 75, during the execution of the warrant, of course, we need probable cause in order to get a warrant, just FYI. During the execution of the warrant at the Mar-a-Lago Club, the FBI seized 102 documents with classification markings on them from his office in the storage room. 
So out of his office, they found 27 documents six were top secret 18 secret three confidential and then out of the storage room they found 75 documents now every single one of these documents uh, is being accounted for and they're watching the movement of each one 11 here were top secret 36 were secret and 28 were confidential so this is pretty specific information that they're able to track can you move the documents a little bit more into frame sure here we go. How is that? Is that better? Are we in frame? Wait, hold on. How, how are we now? Is this okay? Thank you. Is it good? Okay, thank you. I appreciate the uh, feedback. Uh, okay, counts one to 31. All right, so what we've gone through has been the evidence that they had, again, for indictments. We only need probable cause. Uh, for a grand jury to indict. Uh, if we take it to trial, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a much, much higher standard. And so now we're going to get into the counts, and these are going to go back in reference to all of that prior information. Here is the um, U.S. Code section that they are claiming was violated here. So willful retention of national defense information, and then they're going to go through the counts the general allegations of this indictment are realleged and fully incorporated here by reference. Number 77, on or about the date set forth in the table below in Palm Beach County in the Southern District of Florida and elsewhere, the defendant, Donald J. Trump, having unauthorized possession of, and this is an element of the offense, access to and control over documents relating to the national defense did willingly, willfully retain the documents and failed to deliver them, again, I'm highlighting all the elements of the offenses, them to the officer and employee of the United States entitled to receive them, that is Trump, without authorization, retained at the Mar-a-Lago Club documents relating to the national defense, including the following. And then we'll go through each one of the counts. Now, each one of these counts is a separate offense and is given a separate sentence. It can run concurrently or consecutively. Typically, we would probably run these uh, concurrently, but I'll go through each one of these instances. Count one, we've got the date of the offense here and the level of classification as well as a brief detail of that particular document. Of course, no specific information is given here because that would not be uh, appropriate. But count number two, we have this document, which was labeled as top secret as well. They're giving us basically the dates on the documents. So I'll highlight those to show that these are all separate documents. Again, we have another top secret one. This was undated. And we can move on to count four, top secret, dated May 6th, top secret uh, in June 2020. Another one, that's the level of classification, that's the date of the document. Here's another one, classification level along with the date. So they're very, very specific. They know what each and every single one of these documents is, all of them. So there's no doubt of any question of what were the documents. They know exactly what the documents were. Number eight, uh, here's the classification level and the date of the document. Number nine, this one was classified here. This one was an undated document, the brief description. It would be interesting to see how these would be presented in court in front of a jury because of course they would have to be redacted for security. Number 10, Here's the classification. Here's the date of the docket. Number 11, document. There's no marking, so we're not sure what level of classification that is, but it's also undated. So this one doesn't have very much information, number 11. There's not much information on there, so um, that would be interesting to see how they would try to present that in court. Here's number 12. There's the level of classification, and then a summary of what is in there. 13, we've got the type, another undated one. We've got 14, here's the classification. Would the jury have to be given security clearance? 
That's a really great question. And no, all of this stuff would be decided before they presented any of it to the jury, all of these documents. And the judge would go through every single one and make a determination. And they can do that in the legal field. The judge can say, and this was determined in U.S. v. Nixon, as well as um, any of the other cases, the Clinton case, any case where we've had high level kinds of evidence put in front of a grand jury, the judge makes the decision about whether or not uh, it needs to be protected from the jury. So uh, that is made on case by case, and that's been set out by case law since the Nixon case. Number 15, here's our classification level. We've got a document in February 2020. 16. So we're going through again, classification level, date of the document. So they know exactly what this is. Of course, we don't because it's classified. But every single one of these documents, they have a classification on it and what exactly it is. And so they're saying this was in his possession. He did not have authorization for this document. Each one of these. And so I'm going here. Oh, now we're to count 21. Secrets, uh, another top secret one, and this was dated the night 2019. And we're going through again, number 23. These Each one of these is a separate document. Again, this is the classification level. This is the document. They're identifying it by date rather than the type of more information, of course, because this is public. Now, here's the classification. This one's undated, uh, October 24th. November 7th, this one's been redacted, uh, 27th count, again, this is another level for 2019, 28, again, this document that I'm reading right now is a federal indictment, it's public, it's accessible to anyone, it's been filed in court and unsealed, and none of the information I'm sharing here has any kind of classification level whatsoever under any of the United States laws. So we've got, we're all the way at 28 documents at this point. Now we're at 29, 30, and 31 documents. These are all separate documents with specific classification levels and identified with specific dates. So all, each single sheet of paper has been accounted for its classification level and the fact that authorization was not given to him to have that paper and we followed the papers from the white house when he left to his residence in mar-a-lago uh, to various different storage places at mar-a-lago different areas within it uh, and sounds like these documents have flown to multiple places as well so they are well traveled count 32 so 1 through 31 went through each separate document now count 32 is a conspiracy to obstruct justice this is a new code section i always highlight my laws in blue that's if you're wondering what that is for some reason i've just always done that here we go 18 usc section 1512 subsection k the general allegations of this indictment are re-alleged and fully incorporated here by reference. The conspiracy and its objects here from on or about May 11th, that was the date of the subpoena, in or around August 2022 in Palm Beach County, the Southern District of Florida and elsewhere, the defendants, so Donald Trump and Walty Nada, did knowingly combine, conspire, confederate and agree with each other that specific statutory language and with others known and unknown to the grand jury to engage in misleading conduct towards another person and corruptly persuade another person to withhold a record document or other object from an official proceeding in violation of this section of the united states code and to corruptly conceal a record document another object from an official proceeding in violation of this section of the United States Code here. Next, we've got the purpose of the conspiracy, and conspiracy is an inchoate offense, so there's multiple ways that we have to prove a crime that uh, of that nature. The inchoate offenses include attempts, solicitation, and conspiracy. 
We've got the purpose of the conspiracy was for Trump to keep classified documents he had taken with him from the White House and to hide and conceal them from a federal grand jury. That's a pretty bold uh, statement. The manner and means of the conspiracy. The manner and means by which defendants sought to accomplish the objects and purpose of the conspiracy included, among other things, the following. I'm just checking my comments here. Okay. A suggesting Trump attorney one falsely represent to the FBI and grand jury that Trump did not have documents called for by the May 11th subpoena. B, moving boxes of documents to conceal them from Trump attorney one, the FBI and the grand jury. Um, again, I would, would request you to not use the term which when you're referring to this situation. And if you want to talk about wild goose hunt, maybe, sure, but let's leave the witches out of it. Here's uh, subsection C, suggesting that Trump attorney, one, hide or destroy documents called for by the May 11th subpoena. D, providing to the FBI and grand jury just some of the documents, which, again, is typical of what um, Nixon did called for by the May 11th subpoena while Trump's claimed he was cooperating fully, causing a false certification to be submitted to the FBI and the grand jury representing that all documents with classification markings had been produced when in fact they had not, and making false and misleading statements to the FBI, all in violation of Title 18 United States Code Section 1512 subsection K. All right, now we've got count 33, withholding a document or record, and this is a violation of 18 U.S. Code Section 1512, sub B, sub 2, sub A, sub 2, and we've got 82. The general allegations of this indictment are re-alleged and fully incorporated here by reference. From on or about May 11th of 2022 through in and in or around August 2022 in Palm Beach County in the Southern District of Florida and elsewhere, the defendants, Donald J. Trump and Walty Nada, did knowingly engage in misleading conduct towards another person and knowingly corrupt, corruptly persuade and attempt to persuade another person with intent to cause and induce any person to withhold a record, document, or other object from an official proceeding. And this is where we've got that subpoena in question. That is, one, Trump attempted to persuade Trump attorney one to hide and conceal documents from a federal grand jury. And two, Trump and Nada misled Trump attorney one by moving the boxes that contained the documents with classification markings so that Trump attorney one would not find the documents and produce them to a federal grand jury. So... Um, Oh, I saw, I saw something on the equal protection clause, but it's too fast. <laughs> you guys, your comments are going by too fast. We've got all in a violation of Title 18, United States Code, Sections 1512, Sub B, Sub 2, Sub A, and 2. And this takes us to Count 34, Corruptly Concealing a Document or Record, which is in violation of 18 U.S. Code, Section 1512, C, 1, 2, 84, the general allegations of the indictment are re-alleged and incorporated from on or about May 11th of 2022 in or around August 2022 in Palm Beach County in the Southern District of Florida and elsewhere the defendants. Donald J. Trump and Waltine Nada did corruptly conceal a record document and other object and attempted to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity and that's going specifically to those documents. They know exactly which documents are involved and availability for use in official proceeding. That is, Trump and Nada hid the concealed boxes that contained documents with classification markings from Trump Attorney 1 so that Trump Attorney 1 would not find the documents and produce them to a federal grand jury. That would be in violation of Title 18, the United States Code, Sections 1512, sub C, sub 1, and 2. OK, 
count 35, concealing a document in a federal investigation. And that would be in violation of 18 USC section 1519. We've got general allegations again, so we're um, fully incorporating those by reference, and then we're specifying the dates from May 11th to August of 2022. The defendants, Donald Trump, Walty Nada, did knowingly conceal, cover up, falsify, or make a false entry in any record, document, and tangible object with the intent to impede, obstruct, and influence the investigation and proper administration of any matter within the jurisdiction of a department and agency of the United States. And in relation to and contemplation of such matter, that is during a federal criminal investigation being conducted by the FBI. One, Trump and Nada hid, concealed, and covered up from the FBI, Trump's continued possession of the documents with classification markings at the Mar-a-Lago Club. And two, Trump caused a false certificate certification to be submitted to the FBI. These are in violation of Title 18, United States Code Sections 1519 and 2. Now count 36. I think I just saw someone say, who cares what I'm reading? Well, I'm, I believe uh, Mr. Trump would probably be concerned about it. Count 36, scheme to conceal. We've got 18 U.S.C. section 1001 sub A sub 1 sub 2. The general allegations of the indictment realigned, fully incorporated by reference. From May 11th of 2022 to August of 2022 in Palm Beach County, Donald Trump and Walton. Oh, <laughs> oh, look at that. Thank you very much for that in a matter within the jurisdiction of the judicial branch and executive branch of the United States government did knowingly and willfully falsify, conceal, and cover up by any trick, scheme, and device a material fact that is during a federal grand jury investigation and a federal criminal investigation being conducted by the FBI. Trump and NADA hid and concealed from the grand jury and the FBI Trump's continued possession of documents with classification markings. This is the specific language of this section of the United States Code that is being alleged to have been violated. Again, the evidence presented to a grand jury is just that of probable cause, not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what a trial is for. Count 37, false statements and representations. And this would be in violation of 18... U.S. Code Sections 1001, Sub A, Sub 2. Down to 90, we're incorporating again by reference, and then we're setting out the date. On or about June 3rd of 2022, the Palm Beach County and Southern District of Florida, again, we're establishing jurisdiction, so they've got the proper place. Donald J. Trump, in a matter within the jurisdiction of the judicial branch and executive branch of the United States government, did knowingly and willfully make and cause to be made a materially false, fictitious, and fraudulent statement and representation that is during a federal grand jury investigation and a federal criminal investigation being conducted by the FBI. Trump caused the following false statements and representations to be made to the grand jury and the FBI in sworn certification exec executed by Trump attorney three. And these are the three prior statements that they had listed. A diligent search was conducted of the boxes that were moved from the White House to Florida. This search was conducted after the receipt of the subpoena in order to locate any and all documents that are responsive to the subpoena and see any and all responsive documents accompanying this certification. Number 92, the statements and representations set forth above are false, were false, as Trump knew. Again, this goes to the intent level required because Trump had directed that boxes be removed from the storage room before Trump Attorney 1 conducted the June 2nd, 2022 search for the documents with classification markings so that Trump Attorney 1's search would not and did not include all of Trump's boxes that were removed from the White House. Trump Attorney 1's search would not and did not locate all documents responsive to the May 11th subpoena and all responsive documents that were not provided to the FBI and the grand jury with the certification. 
In fact, after June 3rd, more than 100 documents with classification markings remained at the Mar-a-Lago Club until the FBI search on August 8th of 2022. All of this is in a violation of Title 18, the United States Code, Sections 1001, Sub A, Sub 2. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the compliments on the ring. I appreciate that. It was a gift. And yes, I think his attorneys are all uh, struggling. Absolutely struggling. Count 38. Now, count 38 is specifically with regards to Walti Nada. So we are incorporating these here by reference. On May 26th, Nada participated in a voluntary interview with the FBI. During the interview, the FBI explained to Nada that the FBI was investigating how classified documents had been kept at the Mar-a-Lago Club. And the FBI asked Nada questions about the location and movement of Trump's boxes before Trump provided 15 boxes to the National Archives on January 17th of 2022. Nada was represented by counsel and the FBI advised Nada that the interview was voluntary and that he could leave at any time. The FBI also advised Nada that it was a criminal offense to lie to the FBI and the interview was recorded. All right, so just so you know, if you are free to leave, you are not in custody. Just as a quick side note, Walti Nada, in a matter within the jurisdiction of the executive branch of the United States government, did knowingly and willfully make a materially false, fictitious, and fraudulent statement and representation that is in a voluntary interview, voluntary again because he was free to leave, during a federal criminal investigation being conducted by the FBI. Nada was asked the following questions and gave the following false answers. Question. Does any, are you aware of any boxes being brought to his home, his suite? Answer was no. All right, so so to the best of your knowledge, you're saying that those boxes that you brought onto the truck first time you ever laid eyes on them was just the day when Trump employee two needed you to. Answer, correct. To take them, okay. Question, and knowing that we're trying to track the life of these boxes and where they could have been kept and stored and all of that kind of stuff. Answer, mm mm-hmm. Court reporters hate that. (laughs) Question, do you have any information that could, that would, that could help us understand like where they were kept, how they were kept, were they kept secured, were they locked, something that makes the intelligence community feel better about these things, you know? Now, as a side note, as an attorney, I would say, you know, we need to know, our allies need to know that these documents did have some security, but yet again, that doesn't go to the violation of the statutes that are being brought up in this indictment. Answer, I wish. I wish I could tell you. I don't know. I don't. I honestly just don't know. And what? So so you only saw 15 boxes? 15, 17 boxes? Mm-hmm. The day of the move, even they showed up that day? Answer, they were in Pine Hall. Trump employee two just asked me, hey, can we move some boxes? Question, okay. And I was like, okay. All right. And last question. So you didn't know, had no idea how they got there before. And the answer was no. So they're claiming that this information that he gave was false. The underscored statements and representation above were false, as Nada knew, because one, Nada did in fact know that the boxes in Pine Hall had come from the storage room, as Nada himself, with the assistance of Trump employee two, had moved the boxes from the storage room to Pine Hall, and two, Nada had observed the boxes in and moved them various locations at the Mar-a-Lago Club. These are all in can Trump do an Alfred plea? I'm not sure at the federal level what is possible uh, at that uh, level with this kind of a case. I'm not sure an Alfred plea uh, would be permissible under this particular title of the U.S. Code. So those are the 38 counts. Of course, uh, Trump was charged with 37. The 38th count is specific to his co-defendant. Now, when we flip on, we can look through... Um, some more of the technical uh, certification paperwork, but what comes on 
next are the penalty sheets and these go through the maximum term of imprisonment, the mandatory minimum if applicable. So some, some offenses require a mandatory minimum, but here's the maximum term, supervised relief, release and a maximum fine. So under each one of these counts, they will go into each of those pieces. We've got uh, counts one through 31. Now counts one through 31, we went through each one of those classified documents. Each one of those documents could be up to 10 years in prison. The mandatory minimum is not applicable. So there's no minimum that's required, but each document that's mentioned in those first counts are 10 years each. That's a lot. Oh, I assure you I am a real attorney. I've got the student loan debt to prove it. Now counts number 32, the conspiracy to object, obstruct justice here. We've got just one count. We're looking at up to 20 years, no minimal. Three years uh, maximum supervised release. And here's our fine with 33. That's the withholding of the document. And we've got a minimum, we've got another 20 years. So we've got 10 years here for counts one through 31. Then we've got 20, we've got 20 here for count 33. Count 34 is maximum of 20. Again, I'm just pointing out the maximum. There's no required minimum. I, I highly, highly doubt any of the maximums here. I would be completely shocked out of my mind if any of the maxes were used. But we've got concealing a document in a federal investigation. That's 20 years maximum. Scheme to conceal for count 36, that's five years. False statements and representation, also five years for count 37. So that would take care of Donald Trump's. And then we've got a Walti Nada. Now count 32, he's... He did not get charged with those first one through 31 counts where each one of those documents uh, was assessed that 10 year uh, possibility. He's got conspiracy to object to obstruct justice. That's 20 years. He's got withholding a document or a record. That's another 20 years maximum, of course. This again is an indictment where we just need to prove probable cause of violations of the United States Code. This is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Count 34, we've got corruptly concealing a document or record. This is 20 years. 35, concealing a document in a federal investigation. And this one is 20 years. And again, we're referring to only possible terms of incarceration, supervision, and fines. And then number 36, for this count, we've got a possible five years. And for 38, which uh, Trump was not mentioned for 38, just uh, his co-defendant, and he's looking at false statements and representations, and that's a term of five years. So again, those are all of the maximum sentences. Now, I've tried to be as thorough as humanly possible uh, with these documents. I have also tried multiple times to make uh, multiple posts but for some reason they are not being uh, put out into the uh, TikTok world. So this will probably be my, my last time going through this. I did uh, go through this indictment uh, yesterday as well, but wanted to make sure um, that anyone who was wondering could uh, have access to this. Again, this is online. You just need to go in and look up uh, USB Trump and nada you look this up look up indictment and you will find this document online now you want to make sure that you are looking for the actual court file document you're going to know that because it's going to be stamped here with the seal of the court and so this will show you that it's authentic that this is the actual um, document that they're going through and again an indictment is just an accusation. We believe this person committed this specific event and a probable cause backs that up. The grand jury followed through with that. This is not a finding of guilty by any means. We have not had a trial. Uh, so this is only the bare minimal amount of evidence presented to a grand jury in order to find 
probable cause to indict on these charges under these violations of these statutes. So we do not have all of the evidence here. This, again, probable cause is a much, much lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt. We have reasonable suspicion at the very lowest, which is for a stop and frisk. Then we have probable cause for a search, for a search warrant, uh, also for an indictment. And at the very next level, we've got guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the absolute highest level, and that is with our criminal trials. So this, again, is a probable cause-based indictment. I just want to make sure I'm stressing that. How long would a trial like this last? Wow, that's a great question. If we're putting in every single one of these documents and you have to get someone on the stand to testify, that's how you get your evidence into court is you have someone testifying. What's your job? What do you do? How do you, why are you here today? And what's this document? Just to quickly put that foundation down. And so, um, yes, I'd be happy to flip while I'm talking. So if uh, any of that information to do that would require the witnesses. So all of the people investigating, all of the people that moved all of the paperwork, all of the boxes that were moved, any of the guards that were uh, videotaping anything, any of the records that were kept on times, uh, for any of the text messages, all of those witnesses would all have to be called in to present that evidence. And of course, the government bears the burden of proof. That is who has to prove the case. The defendants do not have to prove anything. Um, they have to just defend, defend against the accusations here. So this kind of a trial would take quite a bit of time. This one's flipped. But we've got, this kind of a trial would have a lot of pre-trial motions also. I mean, if you wanted to get into the nitty gritties, there would be a lot of motions in liminees. Uh, there would be a lot of um, different pieces of prejudicial evidence that they would probably want to keep out. And so just the pre-trial motions alone would take a really long time. Going through the voir dire process and trying to find an impartial jury would be incredibly difficult. It's possible, but it would be difficult. So that's going to take a really, really long time to do that. Um, but it, it is possible. So this would definitely take a while. Now, under speedy, under the speedy requirements of the U.S. Constitution, you've got a right to a speedy trial, although that can be waived, but it doesn't have to be waived. And in this situation, with the um, arraignment today, I did not see any information on whether or not he waived his speedy trial rights. I'm assuming that information would come out. But typically, if you do not waive speedy, we still need to get that to trial in front of a jury within a year. Typically, now depending on jurisdictions and because of all of the uh, tangles that we've had because of COVID and so on, our timelines are off a little bit. But in criminal court, we are super, super strict with our time requirements. Um, unlike civil court, where a civil case can go on for years, a case like this would not be a really able to go on for that long unless both parties constantly were asking for continuances. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of facts in here, but again, this is, when I was a prosecutor, it was pretty standard procedure to give, you know, in, information and the evidence that we needed to find probable cause to our grand jury or our trial information if we didn't use a grand jury. But that kind of evidence that we would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt would be about 85% more of what we would have included in that original indictment information, unless there were some unusual pieces. But based off of my experience, I would say that this is just a small percentage of the actual documentation. These are just the absolute most critical pieces uh, of what was needed in order to prove probable cause for each one of these uh, levels of indictments for each account, for each document. So, and because of the sensitive nature of the documents too, there's gonna be a lot of um, interesting ways of trying to present that as evidence. My thoughts would be uh, to try to get a, um, a plea done. 
Uh, there's been some discussion that his co-defendant has been unwilling to um, testify against him in some way. And so there's still that is on the table. But um, we will see what happens. There's no way to know. And this is uh, this level of an indictment uh, for these types of criminal offenses is not something we see very often. This is unusual. I wouldn't say it's a landmark or, you know, huge, crazy moment in life, but I would say it's very unusual to have this many documents, classified documents, traced this specifically um, in this kind of situation. Then, of course, we've got the um, element of him being a former president of the United States. And so that really kind of changes the tone of everything. So, and again, going through all of these counts in every specific document that's been uh, accounted for and so on. So there's a lot of evidence here, but again, I would say this is just the um, top, the tip of the iceberg, as it were. Um, there's going to be a lot more information that comes out, but all of the documents that have been involved in this situation will be very carefully handled from this moment forward um, with that. But these are some pretty uh, serious allegations. Uh, would prison time be involved? I highly doubt it. That would not really serve any purpose. And what, what would be the purpose of holding someone accountable for a criminal offense? And so when judges are assessing appropriate sentencings, as well as juries, you know, they have to assess what would be appropriate in this situation. And so I'm not sure what that would be, but uh, I would highly, I would highly doubt in this situation we'd be looking at um, prison time. But you never know. You never know. A lot of my predictions have been flipped. <laughs> it's hard to tell. But again, you can go through all of this information yourself. You can find all of this. It's free, available online to anyone. And um, you can just look it up. Just make sure that you've got the actual case number, that it was filed in a federal district court. Uh, well, it most certainly is not fiction, but... Sometimes I think it would be easier if it was, but alas, the truth is the truth, and these are legally filed federal documents. So, um, as I go through the last little bits here, but again, I've uh, been unable to actually get any uh, specific videos posted on this for some reason, so this will probably be my last time through this, but... Uh, as new documentation comes in and more evidence comes in on um, any cases that are of this magnitude, I will be uh, reviewing those and trying to get information out. I do try to make things probation, house arrest, yes, those kinds of things, supervised uh, situations would be very likely. And that would probably be part of a plea agreement. So we'll have to see um, how would I personally defend him? I have no idea. I would. The first thing is I would be completely unqualified to defend him because the federal level of these charges would be way beyond what I am capable of doing. So I would not be able to provide him with appropriate um, representation. I just wouldn't. I just don't have the knowledge of this kind of uh situation. And, and I've done homicide cases before. I've done high level complex litigation, but this is a different level. This is a whole new level when we're dealing with this many counts at a federal level with this much description on each one of these uh, pieces. On each piece of paper, they've got so much evidence showing exactly where it was and exactly what it was. So um, I... I would have no way to be able to, in good faith, be able to defend him for that. Yeah, if, if anyone's got any information on Biden, of course, please bring it forward. Or on anyone. I, I don't care who it is. It can be anybody. Um, no one's above the law. No, no one who is in any elected or appointed position 
So if you have information, I personally have not found any um, information on anyone else that people are mentioning, but I would be more than happy to go through any of those documents if anyone could show it to me. Um, or even just give me the search words and I will search for it myself. But um, can we look at George Santos? Well, I suppose we could. Couldn't that would be oh I'm taking notes. Yes, we absolutely could. Uh, there are a few interesting civil lawsuits involving some other various people too that may be um, they also let her amend her complaint. Yes, and that's a very fascinating case, the defamation case, because it just keeps going. And every time uh, anything is said about that can be another potential lawsuit. So we will see uh, how that goes with it. So anyway, <laughs> oh, I've been on now for quite a while, but I appreciate you all joining me tonight. That was uh, hopefully informative. Can he pardon himself? Oh no, the time has passed. And if you look back, we've got a lot of presidents that did a lot of pardoning, like a lot. Uh, Truman parted, pardoned a lot of people, high ranking people, but you've got to be president in order to do that uh, kind of pardoning. And so without that authority backing him up, he would not be able to, only the current president can do a pardon. So, Organized against, okay. Yes, you are, you are very welcome. And, and he, could the co-defendant go to jail? It's possible. I suppose it's possible, but, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell what will happen here. Um, yes, you are, oh, you are most welcome. Thank you for stopping by tonight. I, appreciate that. I just try to give information out. Um, yeah, the comments are <laughs> very interesting, but um, I've been an attorney too long to uh, have any of that uh, really be too troublesome for me, but do have to keep within the community guidelines. But, oh, yes, I'm, I'm so glad. Hopefully this information is helpful for people. And if nothing else, oh, thank you. If nothing else, I, I'm trying to show we have a legitimate, real uh, document here filed in federal court spe specifying in great detail the evidence that is supporting each one of these indictments. So for a grand jury to come back in with a probable cause finding, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but a probable cause finding, uh, with this evidence, and this is all filed in court, 100% legal. Everything here is uh, above table and done appropriately, and the way that this indictment has been worded, in my opinion, is very, very specific and even going beyond what a lot would because they're trying to. It reminds me, honestly, a lot of the Mueller report with its details, um, not quite at that level, because I don't know anything could ever be at that level, but um, ever. <laughs> that man likes to write his reports, but this definitely has a lot of very specific uh, details to it. So if anyone is looking for this, you want to find this, you can look it up online. It is very easily accessible. Um, and again, as you can see, just from the different statutes that are cited here, any kind of false information, including if this would have been a false information somehow filed in a federal court, we would be looking at more than 20 years in prison. So um, I'm trying to catch. Yes, I hope I hope someone has learned something or just, yes, I am an attorney. I'm a licensed attorney. Um, you think the judge will, I, you know, there's no way to know. There's no way to know, but there's a lot of eyes. There's a lot of people watching. And so sometimes that spotlight can also help hold people accountable at different levels. So, so everybody involved in it needs to be at the top of their game. Everybody. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad it was informative. So, but, um, there, no, this was a grand jury. In order for this, there's no proof it was a grand jury. You know, I understand. And I think if you don't work in the legal field, that might be a, a question. 
But because of how this is filed and because of how this is stated, if someone was to um, have made this up and filed this in federal court, I mean, I can't begin to tell you this, this would be small peanuts, uh, small potatoes compared to uh, someone who would have gone through the trouble of somehow fabricating this, putting it through and then filing it in federal court. So that's, I wouldn't say it's completely impossible, but I would highly, highly doubt that that would uh, occur. Oh, I did, I did just read it. I'm sorry if you're coming in, if you're coming in on the tail end here. I did go through um, all 100 pages we went through. Uh, so I'm just kind of summarizing at this point. So, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this will probably be the last time I do this. I did do a live last night, but um, I think we will do it again. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe. I know. I know. I uh, I didn't give a lot of uh, notice about it, but I don't know. I may do another run through here of this. Not tonight. <laughs> you know, I've got to I've got to work in the morning, of course. But yes, I am an attorney, and um, I will maybe go through this again. I'll consider it. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. At this point, this is just one of many legal documents and criminal proceedings that I go through here. So, um, you know, this isn't, I'm definitely, that's the biggest case. I'm making sure to watch very carefully, but um, I will uh, see what I can do about trying to find the time to do this again. It might be later this week or maybe this weekend. We'll have to see. But anyway, thank you all for joining me. And I highly recommend going and finding this yourself. Don't take my word for it, even though I'm trying to show you the exact words and the exact document being filed here, but don't take my word for it. Go look it up yourself. And these are all of the sections of the United States Code that are being uh, utilized here. So you can look it all up yourself, look through the evidence and make your own determinations. Yes, you are most welcome. So thank you, everybody, and I hope you all have a great night. And if any further documentation or anything comes up on this case, I will um, have that up as soon as possible. So yes, you're very welcome. Take care, everybody, and stay safe.